Today's episode, we will talk about one of the worst examples of cultural appropriation in a movie where the centerpiece of the story is supposedly about hip-hop and censorship. The two main characters in the movie are a rapper and a wealthy Manhattan heiress slash socialite. The wealthy daughter, Marcy, is played by Lisa Kudrow, who played Phoebe on Friends. Because that is who we think about when we think hip-hop. Just kidding. She is good at what she does. Just not this. And she should have not done this movie. It is not like she needed the money. Miss Kudrow was still getting that friend's money. And she was far from poor. So this movie was a choice. And a poor one at that. The character of the rapper, Dr. S, was turned down by Chris Rock. And eventually portrayed by Damon Wayans. Chris Rock went on to say in an interview that it was the worst script he had ever read and would have preferred getting a package filled with anthrax. For all you old people out there, remember that whole scare when some anonymous group was just mailing random people anthrax? Oh, the good old days when things were so innocent. Let me tell you, Chris wasn't wrong. The script that eventually became this movie that was in theaters is just plain terrible. So bad that you have to ask, how did this movie get funding, filmed, and then got placing in theaters? Like, was Hollywood that desperate for original content then that they just put anything out? Let's travel back to 2003 and look at a list of movies that came out that year. 2003, Wrong Turn, which was one of my favorite returns to the slasher genre. Mystic River, what a fantastic film. That was an adaption from a book. House of a Thousand Corpses. An introduction to Rob Zombie, rock and roll star turned horror film director, and one of my favorite films of his. Old School came out in 2003. Bad Boys 2. I mean, 2003 so far, it wasn't a bad year for movies, and a decent year for horror and black cinema at that. But let's discuss black movies from that year. As far as Hollywood was concerned, the urban gangster movies from the 90s had either lost popularity or they just didn't care to fund them anymore. I'm going to say they were still popular, but there had to be better portrayals than just a thug image. There were a couple of B and C thug films like there are every year. As far as mainstream in 2003, here comes Nick Cannon and Christina Milian in Love Don't Cost a Thing, Martin Lawrence's National Security, DMX's and Jet Li's Cradle to the Grave. All of these came out in 2003. I mean, some movies in note. But then here comes Chasing Poppy. There's going to be a video for this one because it's not only hip hop that gets culturally appropriated. But I digress and back to Marcy X. So Marcy, the wealthy heiress's father owns the record label that Dr. S is on and the senator named Spinkle played by Christine Baranski who was Hofstetter's mom in The Big Bang Theory. What, I watched that show. So what, it was great. And so was she on the show. But anyway, her character Spinkle is trying to get Dr. S banned. Are you with me so far? Because I know this all sounds familiar. Like it was ripped out of a headline from 10 years prior. And it happened more than once. NWA and 2 Live Crew went through that whole process and won on freedom of speech. And you would think, well, that's how this movie is going to end. But wait. We're going to get there. Now, Marcy's dad has a heart attack because he is worried about his financial stability, which is such a farce of a storyline and a weak one at that. But whatever. So here comes Marcy to save the day for her father. And here's the start of Act 1. Marcy is in a room with her friends. And they're all like, you can save the day. And they go on to list a bunch of philanthropy and good causes that Marcy is in charge of. And then this happens. In the conversation. Here, take a listen. Anna, Time magazine has declared you the most charming white woman in America under 50. Oh, except we're talking about rap. And you know, the inner cities and censorship and the cultural legacy of black people. Oh, I happen to adore black people. Word. Word up. Word perfect. You can get anybody to do anything you want. It's your gift. Yeah. Marcy goes uptown. Here, take a listen. Comes Marcy. Yeah, I'm gonna go see that Dr. S in person on his own turf. I'll explain everything and we can work together. Marcy cares. Marcy loves. Marcy saves her father's life. Yay! So where is this Dr. S? Uptown. Uptown. All the way. 
oh wait, this movie takes place in New York City. Did I mention that? Well, it does. So for those of you that are not familiar with New York City, Uptown is another word for Harlem. So Marcy is Uptown at a Dr. S concert. And she is backstage. Like, of course she would be. Her father probably owns the venue, right? This is the first time we are seeing Dr. S and hearing any of his music. Here, take a listen. Now remember, it's 2003, not 1993. So what's with the I got the power being... Flip you. Flip you for real. Into some song about sexual prowess. Like both versions of I got the power, and I'm not going to talk about one or the other or which one came out first. Because who knows, right? And for those of you who don't know, there was two songs called I Got the Power that were almost exactly the same. One by Chirab G and the other by Snap. And this song was originally recorded by Chirab G and sampled illegally by Snap without Chill's permission. I know I said I wasn't going to speak on it. I lied. And that song was meant to be uplifting with a cool dance track. And I hated both songs. But I got the message behind the groove. Well, that, whew, <laughs> that song was butchered even further with this version, this BS version that is Dr. S just rapping about his male member being all powerful. It's like the producers kept I Got the Power song in the back of their brain that was meant to uplift and just brung it down a couple of hundred notches. But I will continue. Wait, the song sung by Dr. S also mentions that he wants drugs. Forgot to mention that. A little bit... But not insignificant. Tidbit, as it will come up later. Anyway, so the privilege that Marcy begins to show starts here. Now, with all the bragging of wealth and good deeds, nope. It starts here. After Dr. S finishes his first song, she just interrupts him and asks him to change his ways, apologize, and do some good things for the community with her public relations ability to change his image for her father's sake. Well, now, this is where it gets confusing. Because now, all of a sudden, Dr. S goes from, like, Mr. Macho sexual to, like, gangster rapper. In, like, two seconds, he goes back on stage and tells the audience the story of what just happened. It's really like they took both stories of NWA and Two Life Crew and just did one horrible mashup. Anyway, Dr. S asks her to come out on stage and asks for the audience opinion. Well, this is where it gets even weirder because the audience is booing and Dr. S comes out and says, Hell no, I ain't changing because I am a real N-word. And this is Harlem, so get out of my ghetto. Now that's a direct quote from this scene. And you can just tell that all of it was written by a white man. I'm not sure. Hold on, I'm gonna, hold on one second. I'm gonna take a look. Ha, huh, I was right. It was written by Paul Rudnick, a white male from New Jersey. He moved to New York to become a playwright who became famous for writing that movie. It was a comedy about AIDS. Uh, that's right, I said it. It was, yeah, it was called Jeffrey. You did not hear that wrong. It was a comedy about AIDS. Paul later goes on to write screenplays and he makes that play, Jeffrey, into a movie. But after he does movies such as Sister Act 1 and 2, Adam's Family Part 2, and Marcy X, he is an openly gay male, most likely with a black fetish, hence changing this song, I Got the Power, to I Got the Power in My Pants. Which I could care less about his sexual proclivity. Writing the N-word for a black guy to say so is supposed to be okay? Well, it is not okay. And you could just tell when you watch this movie, it wasn't authentic. And even Damon Wayans is like phoning this scene in. It's pretty bad. Then the audience members begin to yell out things like, F her up! And shoot her! Because that's how black people talk, right? Right. Oh, man. Then Dr. S goes on to say things like, Marcy, go home. You ain't real. You are a real ghost to die. He really says that. And even as I'm saying this, I'm not sure what that means. Once again, because like no one talks like that. Paul Rudnick. Marcy takes the word real, like very literal. And doesn't understand the slang, so he explains it to her. And for us at home, the viewing audience, 
It's like Paul's boyfriend at the time was black, and he explained it to him, and Paul was just writing it all down. That's just kind of like how it all feels. The audience is now asking Dr. S to kill her, with a whole lot of neck swinging going on. Marcy now goes, well, if I can get real, whatever the hell that means, a direct quote from the movie, will you go to court tomorrow with me? Dr. asks, well, how will you show us that you were real? What are you going to rap for us? Because that is what real means, right? That you can rap. <laughs> oh boy. Marcy asks, if I do, will you go to court? And of course, Dr. S says, if you do a good job, not thinking she would, he says, yes, of course, I will go to court with you. So Marcy goes and gives the two tries with a horrible beat and fails as Dr. S goes, maybe give her some bass, as if Marcy knows what bass is. She says, yes, give me some bass. And that beat you gave him. And just like that, because that's all she needed. Now Marcy begins to describe what she thinks rap is out loud. And also what she has just been taught and begins to sing her version of I Got the Power. And guess where her power is? Not in her pants. It is in her purse. Like where else would her power be besides her purse? The song is very telling and so true to her white privilege. But now the audience and backup singers are all aboard because that's how easy it is to become a rapper, right? And now everyone is singing a song all together that they are now just hearing for the first time. Gotta love movies, right? So now act two begins and you're like, it can't get any worse, right? Fasten your seatbelts because you are in for a ride. Because now we are introduced to Dr. S's manager. Slash producer and so on, so on. Tubby Fenders. That's his name. Tubby Fenders. Jesus Christ. And Tubby is in jail because, like, where else would he be, right? When you are a white man and your only point of reference to hip-hop managers are, like, Suge Knight and Puffy, who do you think he would choose? Where else would you go but the ex-con route? I mean, there were so many examples he could have taken from. But nah, and he goes one step further and makes him a current convict instead of an ex-convict. I mean, look at this guy with the old-fashioned movie black and white strike prison garb. I know it's supposed to play, you know, it's funny, but I ain't laughing at all. And I don't, I don't know, are you? I don't think you are either. The costume designer, that's my first bone I have to pick with him. Another white guy who wants to play off laughs with stereotypes. Let's move on. <laughs> Let's just go. So now we also meet Dr. S's girlfriend, played by Paula Garces. So much to unpack here. We will get to that. Now Dr. S has done his duty, but Marcy with privilege asks for more. And that is to change Dr. S's image. And why would he go for that? Because she threatens to pull his music off the shelves. And he won't get any more money. I mean, wouldn't that solve all her problems? If she just did that? But no, then we wouldn't have this stupid movie then. So now here we go. She starts to try and smooth out his rough edges. <laughs> Whatever. First thing after the court is to make Dr. S do PSA with a boy band. And this is where we see that the writer and director are just making fun of music. Because Dr. S has to do the PSA with the boy band that is very similar to NSYNC. Have I mentioned the director who is also an actor in the movie? He plays Marcy's father. His name is Richard Benjamin. We will see him soon. Well, anyway, Dr. S takes the band for rehearsals and comes back with the band being completely flamboyant and gay. I bet you he had the whole being real talk with them as well. Let's move on. So now we are in a limo and that they are comparing... Sorry, they, meaning Lisa Kudrow and Damon Wayans are comparing fur coats and jewelry. And Marcy says, you remind me of someone, Dr. S. And Dr. S goes, who? Biggie? Tupac? DMX? She goes, no, my Aunt Esther. Can you just look at him for a second? First of all, which New York City rapper wore his hair like that? And when did Biggie or Tupac ever wear their hair like that? Did anyone bother to do any research at all? Writer, director, costume designer, makeup person, like anyone? 
I bet they couldn't be bothered to. Just another paycheck to them. Okay, let's move on. Now we are at one of Marcy's fundraiser, like thingies. And it's like a get a dinner with a celebrity and check out who the first person is going to be um, and the crowd's reaction. The handsome, the totally dreamy Mr. Donald Trump. I love Donald. She can't be real. Who wants dinner with Donald Trump? You don't have to touch him. Maybe he's changed. That's his real hair. This is whack. Whack? Oh, that means bad. I Just as bad as this movie, if that could have stayed the reaction till the very first election, only if, right? Ooh, well then, Dr. S goes, you need to liven this thing up. And he goes up and auctions himself off. Back, excuse me. Is that Chuck Berry? You see, there, that's another very telling joke. All black people look alike. Okay, so now once again, Dr. S is showing his sexual prowess. And the black man fantasy plays very, very hard in this scene. Check it out. Stop it, please. Hey. We gotta get these wee ones some arms. The fundraiser was for kids who couldn't use their arms or something like that. Something real stupid. My first item up. I need to talk to just the ladies. Oh. Fellas, take five. Oh. He is so sexy. He's a gangster. He raps about guns and bitches and hoes. That's what I said. Didn't he rap about like the power in his pants? And like, there's nothing like gangster about that. Because I know you ladies are all beautiful and banging and alone. Are you alone, mama? I'm with my husband. Yeah, you're alone. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> and y'all... And Dean Wayne's. I mean, come on, man. Why? Let's move on. So who wins the auction with all the rich people in attendance and everyone bidding, even a little boy? I won't go there. I mean, I guess I just did. Who wins? Not the little boy. Thank goodness. But not much better. It's Marcy. She wins the highest bid. And now the movie is taking an even weirder turn. Let's go. It's the start of a romantic tale between Marcy and Dr. S. And it starts in a nightclub where once again Marcy and friends display all their privilege. And I am an African princess strolling along the Nile with my handmaiden. Enough of that. You get the point. But wait, there's more. What was in that weed? The tribal drummer feels our pain. Remember when I said the whole Paula Garces thing? Well, here it is. Young, young, black. If you saw this poster and confused with X Men and saw this in the movies. Stupid. Anyway, um, you see that walk? Yeah, let's go. Let's 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 let's, let's check this out. Baby, I was just back. back. Mind you, we're we're almost literally done with Act Two, and um, it's the first time we see Doctor S and uh, Yolanda. I think her name is in the movie. Paulo Garcez's character together. Right I'm sorry. I was just dancing. I was telling you. You have insulted my people. <sighs> Your people? You've insulted Ricky Martin, Mark Anthony, Christina Aguilera on her father's side. I'm, I'm sorry. Yolanda, baby. Yes. Why is it when a person of Spanish descent comes in? They speak normal until they get mad. Then all of a sudden you hear the accent. Yeah, that 
always has pissed me off. Like, always. It just makes me cringe. You either have the accent or you don't. For sake. A fight between Paula and Marcy takes place. And someone shoots a gun. And like, not even one second later, NYPD shows up. Like, that's ever happened in real life. I mean, Marcy seems to be the only person that gets arrested. Like, that ever happens in real life. <laughs> now we have Act 3. Damn, Act 2 was long. As hell. Well, now we have some conflict and things to be resolved. And it doesn't get any less weird or overtly racist either. No, it doubles down. Alright, here we go. So now Dr. S posts Marcy's bail and shows up wearing this. Does it look familiar like an old African necklace but with bullets? I just can't. I want this video to end. And you know what? We're almost there. So before I finish, let me please ask you. If you like this video so far, give it a, you know, a thumbs up so other people can find this video easier. And subscribe to my channel. I got more videos coming for all types of movies coming very soon. There's a few affiliate links down below to the good 2003 movies I mentioned. If you like, just give them a view and a possible buy so it helps out the channel. Okay, okay, let's get back to Dr. S. Post bail and he is dropping off Marcy and this happened. Uh -huh. When black people make love, is, is it different? From white folks? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. How? Go ahead. Rewind it. Well, Dr. S answers, have you ever been to the zoo? <laughs> nah, I'm just playing. But it doesn't seem that far-fetched from what you've seen so far, right? Like, you, you thought that was real. Anyway, they go home, talk, and then they get down to business. And I mean, by business, like, they have sex. But it's, like, off camera, of course. They only show them, like, give the, you know, they give each other, like, a little peck. Like, Mwah. And then they cut to this scene. Dr. S's posse is so hot. It turns out Freakazoid went to Harvard Business School with my brother. T-Ban is going to open his own restaurant. His Montrell isn't just a lawyer. He is it? I told you they double down. It continues. Now we go back to the prison with Dr. S meeting his manager. And they give him the whole you sold out speech. And the conflict starts because now Dr. S is conflicted. And he starts to talk about what is he doing with Marcy? Like... They rent Meryl Streep movies because being black means you can't watch rom-coms or films that Meryl Streep star in. They go on to list like a lot of so-called not black and very white films. It goes on for like ever. Then they go and turn on the TV where Dr. S is ex fans talk about how he sold out and how he couldn't find a black woman to be with. And mind you, he was with Paula Garces before Marcy. He didn't even officially break up with her yet. He gets called Dr. Seuss instead of Dr. S. So basically, they're taking like his black card away. Dr. S then goes home and turns on the TV and sees Marcy on TV talk about him as he's a different person and he starts having an identity crisis. We're almost done, but it just gets crazier. Everyone is getting ready for an MTV award show and here, check this scene out. I want him right back here in his bed. Okay. But the MTV awards? That damn costume designer thought this would be funny? Come on. Why, Lisa Goudreau? Did you think that was funny? You couldn't have possibly thought this would play for laughs. It's not too much? No, not too much. Wrong. It is too much. You're playing way too much. Senator Spinkle is there in hopes of seeing a whole new Dr. S. Instead, he doubles down on a hardcore misogyny and pisses the senator off. Dr. S manages to give a tape to the senator's son, who was a fan, also very young and apparently gay. A lot to unpack there, but I'll move on. The senator plays the tape and starts to dance to a Dr. S song, all while, unbeknownst to her, she is being videotaped by her son. Fast forward to Dr. S taking a step back at the senator's hearing and explaining his hardcore lyrics, lyrics as to be actually a metaphor for being good and lets the senator know he recorded her. So she has to fall in line and happy ending. Everyone is happy and Marcy and Dr. S are in love. 
Yay. No, no, wait. There's an explanation to the title of the movie. It's about converting to Islam, right? <laughs> nah, nah. But here's the bullet outfit in pink on Marcy. All characters do an end sequence rap and roll credits. All right. Thanks for staying to the end. And remember to do what makes you happy. And for me, that is watching movies and talking about them. So until next video, latest. It all connects. I call my label Marcy X. I'm down, I'm total sex. I made parole in Marcy X. What they call?